Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and you'll see behind me in around balloons and all sorts of things. This week was my birthday and people sent me flowers and my cat bought me presents and sent me a card. He sends his cat nanny shopping. I know it's like ridiculously excessive but if you knew my cat he's the kind of cat who needs a cat nanny <laughs> who goes shopping for him and takes care of him when I'm gone so anyway I had a great birthday I'm 62 years old hard to believe isn't it hard to believe I've been around for 62 years so here's to 62 more because I have lots of things to do and think about and change and all that kind of stuff so anyway as usual just a few announcements um, conference is a couple weeks away uh, November 9th through 11 here in Columbus, Ohio. We have amazing speakers. Yesterday I had the pleasure of speaking with Cheryl Atkinson on the phone for a while and I was excited when I invited her to speak um, because of who she is. She's a very principled investigative reporter who covers politics and a lot of medicine and um, she is a fellow truth teller. teller. She's one of those people that if Cheryl says it you can believe it and take it to the bank. She's meticulous in the way that she reports things. And so um, the evening with Cheryl, which is part of the package, um, includes uh, an extensive Q&A uh, with her. Um, I'm gonna interview her. She doesn't like to give lectures. She likes to do interaction with the audience. And so um, just think about, look her up and see if this is the kind of person you'd like to spend Saturday night asking questions of about all kinds of health related topics. I'm so excited about that. So lots of other great speakers, fabulous meals, breakout sessions where you get to spend time with the topics that you're really interested in, get some extra attention in those areas, and uh, cooking and food and just everything. So wellnessformhealth.com, conference flyer is posted there. We have room for a few more people. Um, also, I'll remind you, we have a lot of new courses right now uh, that will be some available now and some that will be available uh, during next year. I usually teach classes live one time and then uh, put them on a video platform. So diabetes, um, health benefits and risks of cannabis, diet, exercise and mental health, irritable bowel, inflammatory bowel, time management, your amazing microbiome, cognitive health and Alzheimer's very long list of new courses and we have some wonderful packages that expire November 15th. If you're coming to conference, you guys are coming to conference now, you get $500 toward an even better price. So make sure you check your own um, discount packages and all that sort of thing. But for those of you who aren't coming to conference, we do have special offers for you too. They're just not quite as sweet as for the people coming to conference. Um, one thing I wanted to address, because I've gotten a bunch of emails about it, and I think it is a topic we should spend a little bit of time on, is a couple weeks ago I did a video clip on what had happened at Cochrane Collaboration. Um, which is that the organization which used to pride itself in uh, being objective, reporting everything objectively, no financial conflicts of interest, etc., sort of degenerated. And through a huge debacle that involved uh, Dr. Gercha taking on the vaccine issue, um, that's the biggest reason why he was ousted by the Board of Governors. And I think um, a, a, in addition to that, the psych drug issue, he's been helping people withdraw from psychiatric drugs. So my point in all of this is many of you have written and said, oh my gosh, if Cochrane isn't reliable, who do we pay attention to? Well, me, that's a good person to pay attention to, but, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And here's what I mean by that. First of all, Cochrane reviews were taken to the bank accurate for a very long time. And this problem developed fairly recently. So if you're looking at the Cochrane library and you're looking at things that were written four, five, six, seven, eight years ago, way back, those are fine. So, so the whole library didn't get corrupted as a result of Garcia leaving. The second thing is if you look at who was writing those articles way back when, and then you search the library um, and look for those same names showing up, those are the people who, who really are not conflicted and, um, and, have, um, and, and, and I think you can rely on. So for example, the rebuttal that I mentioned in the previous video clip that Gertrude and Tom Jefferson, and um, I can't remember the third author right offhand, Lars Jorgensen might have been, I'm not sure, but, but those three, even though that's a recent article, if you go back, they've done a lot of Cochrane reviews from way, way back. So it takes a little bit more discernment to go into the Cochrane Library. Right now you have to look at the date of the article and if it's more recent, who wrote it. But um, the Cochrane Library is still 
um, is still a reliable source of information, just watch out. And, and by the way, some of you, you write me angry emails about it, and I know you're frustrated. It's like, well, now what am I supposed to do? Well, you know, the reason I put out these video clips every week is now what you're supposed to do is to learn how to think for yourself and how to evaluate this information because um, it, it, that's the key to, to becoming an informed consumer and not getting hurt. So, yeah, it's good to have a source where almost everything is okay, but, but you need to understand this stuff. I had a conversation with somebody this morning that was sort of along that line. Uh, we were talking about, uh, she's new to all of this, and we were talking about how confusing everything is. And she said, you know, I read this, and this expert says this, I read somebody else. And, and so what's happening, because she doesn't really understand, is the, the strongest personality wins and the most recent thing read wins, you know. And, and at some point in time, you just got to settle down and, and learn about it. And you guys do this with everything else. I mean, you've heard me say it before, cars, houses, retirement accounts, college educations for your kids. I mean, you all understand you got to buckle down and pay attention before you sign your name to something when you're making important decisions like that, right? So just do that here. That's what we're here for. Um, yeah, a lot of you write me emails asking me for a doctor referral, and we don't do that because we're not in any position to vet doctors and, and keep up with what they're doing in their practices, but we can help you to interact safely with the doctors you have by teaching you how to be informed. That's a much better idea. We can't change all the doctors in America, and there aren't enough enlightened doctors in North America or around the world to take care of all the people who are now starting to get on board and say, wow, I've got to look at alternatives and that sort of thing. So the consumer has to take responsibility. And there's a great article about that that I think you'll find really interesting coming up in the November 5th newsletter. So if you're not a subscriber to the newsletter, you can become one by emailing pampopper at msn.com. Also, to talk about any of these things that I've mentioned, pampopper at msn.com, and keep those inquiries about careers coming too. All right, so you know any chance I get to promote exercise, I'm like all over that. So when an article, when I see information in medical journals, it gives me things to start to follow up on. And so anything I see that's related to exercise, I'm all over that because it's the hardest thing to get people to do on a regular basis. And I, I understand. I mean, I used to not exercise. I spent the first 20 years of my adult life sitting. As it turns out, that was a bad choice. I don't recommend it. But that's what I did, so I get it. I get it that it's hard to, um, to, to get moving again, and, and it's unfamiliar, and you're not used to spending the time and all that. But I'm going to give you some reasons why you should do it. All right, the term sarcopenia it was coined by Erwin Rosenberg at Tufts University in 1988 to describe the age-related decline in muscle that afflicts most humans. There are several underlying mechanisms for this degeneration, which include uh, decreased numbers of muscle stem cells, mitochondrial dysfunction, decline in protein quality, and changes in hormone regulation. The result is increasing muscle weakness, which is a major, major contributing factor to frailty in elder people, and a reduced ability to complete just day-to-day -day tasks like bending over and tying your shoes and walking up and down stairs, picking something up and carrying it across the room. The reason this is important is frailty in, it increases the risk of falls and injuries, and it is the leading reason why people end up in nursing homes. I mean, I don't think anybody becomes an adult and says, you know what my goal is when I get older? I want to live the last 20 years of my life laying in bed in a room by myself. Nobody plans for that. It just happens as a result of becoming more frail as we age. So. The decline that I'm talking about is not inevitable, and research shows clearly that it can be avoided and even reversed with exercise. Once a human reaches adulthood, muscle cells stop dividing, and instead, muscle growth and repair are facilitated by muscle stem cells, which are referred to as satellite cells. And the reason we call them that is they're positioned at the edge of the muscle fiber. As people age, the number of satellite cells is reduced from a high of 8% of the muscle nucleus to about 0.8% for people in their 70s, so that's quite a decline. The mitochondria of muscle cells are also important and comprise 5 to 12 percent of the volume of muscle fibers, and aging changes this too. It reduces both the number and function of mitochondrial cells in the skeletal muscles of humans. Another issue is that muscles of older people have lower rates of autophagy than younger people. Now, if you're not familiar with that term, autophagy is the process by which damaged proteins, organelles, and waste product and debris are recycled and then used for function. Decreased autophagy results in decreased regeneration of muscle cells, and muscles become smaller and weaker over time. 
while aging itself can cause a lot of these negative changes in muscle size and strength and function, inactivity accelerates the process. Conversely, exercise can prevent the aging of muscles and people can remain strong throughout their lifetimes. For example, a recent study of 125 amateur cyclists showed that older cyclists who exercised regularly had no loss in muscle mass or strength. So think about living to be 105 or 110 and still living in your own house and, and, um, and going to work every day if you choose to. Some people say, well, I don't want to work till I'm 105. Well, then think about taking beautiful trips and, and seeing more of the country you live in and all that stuff, right? You have to be mobile and you have to be strong to be able to do those things. Another benefit of exercise is that it can counter the drop in satellite cells normally associated with aging. Research shows that satellite cell pools increase within only four days of a single one session of exercise, and then they remain higher as long as you continue to exercise. So even a single exercise session starts to make things better, which doesn't mean you exercise once and sit down for another 20 years, but it does mean that the, the effect is pretty quick. Both strength training and high intensity interval training are effective in increasing mitochondrial capacity on muscle cells, another issue associated with aging. In a study that included both younger, 18 to 30 years of age, and older, 65 to 80 year olds, um, younger participants had a 49% increase in mitochondrial capacity. Older volunteers experienced a 69% increase in, in, as a result of high intensity interval training. An additional benefit was improved insulin sensitivity. And since insulin sensitivity is important for preventing uh, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, this is a very important thing. It, it just goes to the fact that keeping yourself in great shape is the best way to avoid all kinds of degenerative disease and degeneration. Exercise is literally the fountain of youth. A group of adults over age 70 with gene profiles showing age-related mitochondrial dysfunction were able to reverse this condition with six months of resistance exercise. Their genetic profiles showed reverse aging and both muscle strength and function increased as a result of strength training. Age-related autophagy, I mentioned that earlier, can also be reversed with exercise. In one study, markers of autophagy increased within the first two hours of recovery from a single exercise session and continued to increase over an eight-week period of time of training. Again, that very quick um, response to exercise, things immediately start to get better. It's like your body is saying, thank you so much for getting up off of the couch and moving around. Another study showed that autophagy signaling is activated after only 60 minutes of exercise independent of nutritional status, which does not mean you shouldn't pay attention to what you eat. I'm just saying exercise is the fountain of youth. Muscle makes up between 30 and 40 percent of the total mass of the body. Muscle strength is required for movement and balance and for engaging in activities required for daily living. Additionally, muscle cells are involved in glucose, lipid, and amino acid regulation. So optimal health is not possible without maintaining healthy skeletal muscle, and the maintenance of healthy muscle depends in large part on regular exercise. So I originally found a single article that talked about exercise um, preserving muscle mass, and from that I started doing research and came up with, I think there are... Um, eight uh, references for this particular article. And it just goes to the fact that, uh, I've said this for years, humans are designed for movement. And until a very recent time, I mean, if you look at the timeline of humans on the planet, we're talking about like this much, this tiny little sliver over here is where we've had the option to sit down and not move in our adult years. And it's not good for us because we are designed to be active people. That's how we survived all these years. So I hope I've motivated you to get up and move. All right, um, hit that subscribe button so you can watch these videos all the time. It's in the corner of your screen. Tell your friends about this. We're growing our subscriber base and we're doing some giveaways as we, meet, as we uh, reach various benchmarks. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.